a neighbor and tell him you look disgustingly good today. Why do we give? We give to make a difference, to touch hearts and change lives. We give to feed the hungry, care for the sick, and comfort those in need. We give to show Jesus to our neighbors, our community, and the world. We give as an act of worship to a God who has given everything. We give because we are the church, the body of Christ, called to be a light in the darkness, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We are the hands and feet of Jesus, sharing the hope of the gospel. This is why we give.
been called into your presence, into your house this morning. Let our worship be a thanks for the work that you've already done in our lives. There's not a song we could sing. There's not a church program we could put together. There's not a sermon we could preach to thank you enough for sending your son Jesus to not only die on the cross, but he took our sin upon him. Thank you, Jesus, for trading your glory for our filth. Thank you for being obedient to death, even death on a cross. And thank you for rising from the grave, victorious over sin and death. And thank you, God, that the same spirit that raised him from the dead lives in us. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Lord, let us never take that for granted. And Lord, as if that wasn't enough, you tell us to cast your cares upon you because you care for us. Lord, for those at the altar and for those doing business with you in the pews right now, for those online who are experiencing you, pursuing them with the same love that you pursued us. Lord, we don't know every detail. We don't have to. All we have to know is that you're in control and that you love us so much that you promise to never leave us or forsake us. Lord, that is worth so much more than a hallelujah, but it's what we bring to you today. And so, Father God, I would ask right now that you would open the eyes of our heart, that you would begin to prepare the soil of our heart to not only hear the word, but to be doers of the word, that, Father God, by your grace, we would walk out these doors a little more like your son Jesus than when we were when we walked in. God, give us a burden to be salt and light in a town, in a workplace, in a world that desperately needs you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Usually at this time, I invite the children to run away. Uh, I am not doing that today. You will notice that, that their normal place is a little vacant. They are upstairs having a full morning of worship together, uh, working on some songs. They're preparing for us. To, they'll be sharing in a few weeks with us as the people, so they don't get to run away today. Ian did not know he was telling you a fib, because I did not get a chance to tell him that he was telling you a fib. Uh, so just offer forgiveness for that venial sin. Lying is always wrong. We did not get in $160,000 worth of pledges for our capital campaign. We got in $185,000 for our capital campaign. I, I, please be applauding yourself in that. That is just a, a staggering amount. That was just one week of, of pledges. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God is, is clearly leading us as a people, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, it, it's wonderful. Like This is, this is going to help us out and set us on a great foundation for future ministry. And I, I appreciate your faithfulness in this endeavor. I appreciate your willingness to pledge. Uh, I, I'm hoping that it's not just vain pledges. No, I'm just kidding. Um, there are some passages in the Bible that are easy to love. There, there are certain parts of the Bible that, that fit like a nice, warm blanket, that, that kind of envelop you and, and, and just make you feel good in the world. Uh, things like Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. That, that's such a comforting passage. Like Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. If, if I'm thinking of things like John 3.16 and Corinthians uh, 13, all about love and God's love, th there are some passages in the Bible that are easy to love. And then there's what I'm preaching on today that is, that is not as easy to love. There are certain passages in the Bible that are thorny, prickly messes that scratch and tear and annoy I began this series on the first Peter several weeks ago by saying I didn't really like this book, that I, there, there are some parts in it that I disagree with in this letter. And, and don't get me wrong, I love 
chapter 3, verse 1. It's my life verse. I have it tattooed on my chest. If you have a Bible, you can flip over there and read vigorously what I'm talking about in that and get why that's funny. Uh, some of you ladies probably need to read chapter 3, verse 3 a little bit more closely. That is not my life verse, but it does talk about women wearing braided hair. I know. Wearing jewelry. I'm not going to call out names this morning, but we will be having an altar call. <laughs> there are things in 1 Peter that are difficult to, to wrap our minds around. And, and I hope that at the end of our time together today, we will have a little bit of more context to understand. And maybe even the freedom to respectfully disagree with Scripture. Uh, to bring the point home, I want to start reading. I'm actually going to back up and not verse 19, but verse 18 of chapter 2. This verse gets cut out of the normal reading of this passage for, for good reason, but I, I, I want to give it its due and, and, and allow it to be here. So hear now the word of the Lord. Slaves, accept the authority of your masters. With all deference, not only those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. Verse 19, for it is a credit to you, for it is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow it in his steps. He committed no sins, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sin we might live for righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. For if you were going astray, for you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your soul. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the Nazarene church, we believe in what's called the plenary inspiration of the scripture. We're going into the manual this morning, so hang on, it's about to get exciting. That's what our statement of faith, uh, when our doctor, and we, we say we believe in the plenary inspiration of scripture. Now, plenary is a word that you use every day in life. I get it. But it means general. It means full. It means all. All of scripture is divinely inspired, meaning that God was at work in these words, in the people who wrote them, calling them to put down their thoughts on paper, in the people who passed them on and shared them, that the, the, there was something different in these words than other do ancient documents, in the people who translated it. All the whole thing fully is inspired by God's Spirit and working through it. We also believe, as Nazarenes, this is particular to us in this particular tribe, we believe that the Bible is inerrant. Now, that means without fault or without error. But we have a little phrase that we tag on to that. We, we, we nuance it a little bit. We believe that it is inerrant in all things necessary for salvation. We believe that God is working without error in this book in all things necessary for salvation. We believe the whole thing is caught up in the movement of God, but we have some freedom to, to make some judgments, to talk back to Scripture. There was a time when we didn't do this as Nazarenes. There was, there was a time where we, we took the Bible very, very literally. I remember being in church, and there would be ladies who did not braid their hair, 
who did not wear makeup, who did not have ear pierced ears. They would be plain in dress. There would be men who wore ties to every service. I'm looking around. Guys, you got to step it up. There would be men who, who came to church and though they were married, were not wearing wedding rings or, or watches on their wrist. They may have a pocket watch, but not a wrist watch. There would be people who showed up without tattoos, who did not have TVs in their homes, who shunned the influences of the world. And, and I want to say, I'm, I'm making a little bit of light, but I have a lot of respect for those who lived in that tradition, for those in our past who dressed modestly and who, who abstained from entertainment and who did not adorn themselves with jewelry because they took the Bible very, very seriously. And they took their commitments and they sacrificed themselves. They didn't spend a lot of money in, in vain adornments, but they gave a lot of money to the church. They sacrificed for their neighbors in their love and genuineness. You, you hear me say this. They knew something about Jesus, and they were willing to deny themselves to live out that life. What I don't have a lot of respect for is for people who do the opposite, who, who, who want to take Scripture and apply it to someone else, that they must live to a standard of sacrifice that I do not have to live to. Let me give you three, it's a fancy word is hermeneutical clues, three clues for interpreting and maybe even disagreeing with Scripture. N number one, when we come to this text, when we come to the Bible, all of the Bible, you have to realize that this book was not written to you. I know you are all uh, very special little boys and girls, and that everything in the world revolves around you. This book does not. The, the stories and the words that were written here are written to someone else. We are, we are reading someone else's mail. First Peter was written to a group of people, women and slaves and uh, exiles, who were living in Turkey. As I look over my congregation this morning, forgive me for those who are online, if you happen to be in Turkey today, None of you are living there. None of you are living in the first century, which is when this book was written. I don't think that the people who wrote the books of the New Testament had any idea that these words would be being read thousands and thousands of years later. They had no comprehension of, of, of how God was going to speak through them century after century. And they had no concept for how the world was going to change. These letters were written by leaders of the church in a certain Christian community that lived in a certain times under a certain set of circumstances. And those, that context added nuance to what they said. Back in 2020, we were scrambling around as Nazarenes and Christians trying to adapt to the world that all of a sudden had shut down around us. You remember that. And we were coming back to church, and, and my DS, and, and, and the, where I lived at the time, sent out a letter asking for all churches when they gathered back to wear masks. It was a kind of a pastoral letter. He, he had some scriptural reasons and some theological reasons. If we were to take that letter written by my DS, bury it in the sand for a thousand years, and dig it back up, you might think that it was re responsible for all Christians at everywhere to wear masks. And that would be not true. You hear what I'm saying, church? Okay. Number two, Peter is set within a cultural context of his day, and he was not even aware of what was around him in the same way that we are not aware. It was the water in which he swam, and like a fish, he did not know he was wet. And that culture was very, very different than our culture. Let me give you a couple examples. Uh, first, Peter did not invent the practice of slavery. And he very much did not invent the practice of racialized chattel slavery that defined our country. Slavery back then was an economic situation, much like bankruptcy is today. 
You were sold into slavery like Joseph was. It was not a condition that defined your personhood. It was not somehow impingent upon you by your genetics that somehow defined you as three-fifths of someone else. It was not defined by your skin color. It was not something you passed down to your children. You hear how slavery was very, very different than the slavery that defined our history. Peter was a part of a culture that accepted a patriarchal view of society. They had no concept of egalitarianism or people being all together. Men were in charge, both politically according to Rome and theologically according to Judaism. Men were assumed to be in charge. Nobody questioned that role. It will take a long time for men to look around and see the mess that we had made of the world before we change. Actually, that's not what happened at all. There has never been a man that looked at the state of the world and said, wow, this is my fault. I should let someone else have a say-so. We have egalitarianism, and, and women have the right to vote and have the same rights because they fought for it. A lady in the church want to say amen? amen. And they clawed, and they uh, grabbed hold of rights that we tried to deny them, or people that looked like me tried to deny them. Their culture was different than ours. And in that culture where Peter is writing, a place where the church was not established, where they were not being systemically persecuted and killed for their faith, where they were not being defined for generation to generation by their social roles, Peter tells his fledgling congregation to keep their head down. Don't make waves. Don't cause a stink. Do what you're doing and live according to how Jesus wants you to live in the circumstances you find yourself. He says this because like the entire church, he believed that Jesus was coming back. But not coming back 2,000 years or 3,000 years later. The early church believed Jesus was coming back imminently, as soon as possible. That's what he said. On the Mount of Olives, right as he was ascending up into heaven, he said, I will return in this same manner. I'll be back, he says, donning his best Terminator accent. And his followers assumed that he meant immediately, that it would be five or ten, maybe twenty years, and they would see him again. And when you're thinking about Jesus' imminent return, it changes the things you can deal with. You can endure a lot. You can keep your head down and deal with frustration and injustice if it's just for a little bit of time. The thought that we would be gathering 2,023 years later, reading his little letter sent to some exiles dealing with difficult life situations would be unimaginable. We're reading someone else's mail. We're reading a letter written to a very different context than we inhabit. Number three, the third hermeneutical key, the third thing for interpretation is probably the most important. We come to the Bible and we read it through the lens of Jesus. Jesus is the definitive revelation of who God is. You know, we call call this the Word of God sometimes. But we always need to make sure when we say that, we're referring to this with a lowercase w. Because according to John 1, the word is actually Jesus Christ. Divinely inspired Son of God. That is the capital word of God. That is the one spoken upon us. That is the true expression of God in the world. What Scripture does is it provides a way for us to encounter Jesus. But once you have encountered Jesus, it changes everything. And it shapes your eyes and it shapes your mind. Therefore, we read Scripture Christologically. We read Scripture through the lens of Jesus. Let me give you an example of how this happens. Uh, One of the key persons in our tradition is a guy named John Wesley. You might have heard of him. He lived in England in the 1700s, and he preached, and he he pastored, and he cared for people. He he came to Savannah for a little bit and failed miserably. Uh, Anyway, that doesn't matter. He was kind of the theological grandfather of our tradition. During his day, one of the hot-button topics that everybody was fighting over was predestination, which, you know, 
All of our hot button topics don't really get nearly as exciting as this. They were fighting in the church over how does God save people? Does God just choose who God is going to save no matter what they want and condemn some to heaven? Wait, hold on, that's not right. Condemn some to hell and bless others with heaven by God's capricious choice. And John Wesley did not agree with that. In fact, he very much disagreed in in his sermon 128. If you're looking this up, John Wesley sermon 128, it's They didn't really understand how good titles should be back then. He he takes predestination to task, and he writes this. No scripture can mean that God is not love, or that his mercy is not over all of his works. That is, whatever it proves besides, no scripture can prove predestination. You see, John Wesley had this idea that God is love, expressed and demonstrated by who Jesus is. And that allowed him to see and read Scripture differently. He goes on in that sermon, in a, in a step that I'm not sure about, but he goes on and says that belief in predestination makes God worse than the devil. I don't know about that, but that's where he was. He was so convinced and confident because Jesus has revealed that God is love. And so we read Scripture Christologically. We read it to tell us and illuminate about who Jesus is. It's, it's about him. So with those three hermeneutical tools, we're reading someone else's mail. We're reading a, a story written in a very different context. We're reading through the lens of Jesus what do we do with 1 Peter 2? One response would be to get rid of it. To just rip it out and move on with our life. That's not one I'm very comfortable with. I think if we were to get rid of 1 Peter, we would miss out on some powerful words. 1 Peter chapter 4 uh, says that love covers a multitude of sins. Verse 8, above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins just imagine church if we had that tattooed on our heart imagine if that was the way that we approached all situations not when someone sinned against us that we needed repentance or judgment or laws or ordinances or revenge what if we responded by love and and we would miss out on that calling to love that covers up others and our own sin if we were to get rid of all of 1 Peter. We as Nazarenes do live in a tradition of John Wesley that, has a, that says that the traditional reading and, and interpretations of these texts can be wrong. That, that when we as Christians have used these verses to subjugate and put down and hold captive people that are not like us or different than us, we have missed the boat. When we use that to justify the way we order our lives, we have not only denied the voice of God, but we have not looked on favor with our beloved others. We have increased suffering instead of ending it. Here's the problem with the text. How do we read this as Scripture and hear the word of inspiration behind it? I think we do it by looking at who Jesus was. Jesus Christ, God in flesh, made the free choice to suffer for others. There was no one telling Jesus that he had to do it. Jesus took on the cross freely. In his sacrifice, in his suffering, there was no threatening, there was no cursing, there was no hatred, there was no vengeance or retribution. It was only forgiveness that he offered. And Peter says that that is the central message of the cross, that Christ came He who committed no sin, no deceit was found in him. He took on our abuse freely. This is where I think we have gone wrong in the church. That we in our places of comfort, without sacrificing, have looked at other people and said, hey, you over there, you need to sacrifice. In our possesses of privilege and power, we've looked at others and said, you need to give up. I don't. The truth of the gospel starts in this place where Jesus made the free decision, to that place of autonomy to sacrifice and suffer. 
He did not do it. No one forced him to. He was able to make that free choice. That is the key. The the call for us, then, is to follow Jesus, each and every one of us, into that place. Not from force or coercion, not because of our role in society, not because of the color of our skin or our genetic makeup. We are to step, all of us, one and every one, into that place of self-sacrifice where we lay down our life just as Peter called, just as Jesus did. There's a story in Acts chapter 2. The, the, the church is, is new. It's a brand new baby in the world. They don't know what they're doing yet. They hadn't had good pews or air conditioning or any of the things we take for granted. And what they did is they just started living life together. They started being people who sacrificed for one another. They were a community that laid down their desires for other people. And Luke tells it this way. He says, that They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer, and all came upon everyone because of the many signs and wonders that the early church did. You want to know what will change this world? It's when Christians begin to lay down their life for others. It is when Christians respond not with hate and not with judgment, but with love to persecution and hurt. It is when Christians take up their cross and follow after our Savior and lay down our lives for a community and for strangers. That's what the early church did. That is what we have to do. And when we do it, beloved, when we follow after Christ's self-sacrificial love, when we follow after Jesus who was holy, self-giving love, then all will come upon this world. And God's kingdom will break out upon us. And we will see the good news of Easter explode out and transform those around us. But we don't do that on our own. It's not our our will that that girds itself up and, and goes out and sacrifices. We do that because Jesus has sacrificed for us. Today we turn to Jesus' table. The Lord's meal. Where Christ has set us an example. Where He willingly laid His life down, gave up His body and His blood for the life of the world. The communion supper instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a sacrament which proclaims His life, His death, and His resurrection, and the hope of His coming again. This meal shows forth the Lord's death until His return. This supper is a means of grace in which Christ is present by the Spirit, and it is to be received in reverent appreciation and gratefulness for the work that Jesus has done. This is the Lord's table. It is not my table. It is not the Nazarene church's table. It is God's table. And God invites all who are truly repentant and forsaking their sins and believe upon Jesus for salvation. You are invited to participate in this holy meal. We come to this table as one body to be renewed in life and salvation and to be made one by His Spirit. And so in the unity of the church, we confess our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Holy God, we gather at this your table in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who by your Spirit was anointed to preach good news to the poor. Proclaim release to the captives to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Christ healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners, and established the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. We live in the hope of his coming again. On the night in which he was betrayed, he gave, took the bread. He gave thanks to you in heaven. He broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup. 
He gave thanks. He passed it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we gather as the body of Christ to offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving. And we pray, O Holy Spirit, that you may be poured out on us and on these your gifts. Make them by the power of your Spirit to be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one in Christ, one with each other, one in the ministry of Christ to the world, until he comes in the final victory. And now as our Savior Christ taught, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And amen. I'm going to invite our servants to come forward. As they distribute the elements, I would invite you to take the bread and the juice and hold them so that we may receive together. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you. Preserve you blameless and everlasting life. Eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and be thankful. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ shed for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and be thankful. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for the gift, the sacrificial gift of your body and blood. We thank you, O God, that while we were still sinners, you sent Christ to die for us. And that through his death, you have purchased a new life for us, redeemed from the wounds of sin, rescued from the threat of hell. We are able to live self giving lives. I pray, O oh God, that we who have been fed by the spiritual food of your body and blood would follow your example, that we would pour out our lives for others, that we would care, that we would love, that we would serve in the same manner that you have cared and loved and served us. And when we do, O oh God, when we see your kingdom coming around us in surprising ways, when we see the world being reformed by the giving love of our God, when we see enemies become friends and, 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 and divisions fall apart, we will give you all the honor and glory. 